Thank you very much. Thank you. You're pretty lively for a Baptist, I must say. <laughs> you know, the, the ba Baptist pastor that told me that the Baptist will be first in heaven. Because the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. And then, <laughs> but then uh, he told me that. <laughs> well, you're pretty lively, so I, I, I think it's a joke after all. And I'm very, I, actually, I, I was invited to several Baptist churches throughout my uh, life and I, I always found them much different than what they describe themselves <laughs> and uh, this is great um, to be here this is the ta very tail end of a very long um, speaking tour that I, uh, I had uh, for the most part in Mexico this time I uh, spoke in probably <clears throat> eight different conferences there and one of the things that I was encouraged by the most is that the younger generation is um, getting more and more involved and into the Word of God over there, I'm saying. I'm not sure what's going on here. I'll find out shortly. But uh, the thing is, uh, you know, we, as much as we want to study the Word, we have to also pay attention to the fact that there's those generations behind us that um, for the most part the world is doing a very good job in taking them away from the Word of God and from um, Jesus and so we have to really praise God when we see 15 year old and 18 year old and 21 year old that are uh, running to prophecy conferences and they really want to understand how current events happening in the world today are actually something that the world uh, could have known if they only read the Bible. The Bible to me is not a religious book. In fact, um, the Bible to me is the proof that religion is wrong. Um, I remember the first time um, when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, it was still without reading a verse in the New Testament. Um, you know, Jesus himself never preached from the New Testament. Uh, <laughs> and and, and in, in, if anything, every time he had to prove his Messiahship, he only used the Old Testament. Obviously, that's the only thing that was there at that time. And so um, the first book that I read was the book of the prophet Isaiah. I was always drawn to what the prophets had to say because I found them interesting characters. I, I found them people that are so different than what prophets today are. <laughs> you know, people that are calling themselves prophets nowadays. Um, I always tell people I'm, a non, I'm from a non-profit organization. Uh, <laughs> don't count me as one of those. Um, I truly believe that uh, the Lord speaks or spoke in the ancient times um, to the fathers, as Hebrews 1 says, uh, he spoke to the fathers through the prophets. And in these last days, of course, he speak to us through Jesus Christ. So Jesus continued in the mantle of that which the Old, Pro Old Testament prophets began, and all of them spoke of him, obviously, and most of them did not even know that. That's the beauty about the prophets. They saw things, they, they could uh, describe events that they had no clue uh, what they're going to look like and, and, and when they will take place. And sometimes you see that a prophet can talk about the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ in the same chapter without knowing how how much of a valley between those two mountain peaks you're going to have of almost 2,000 years. So it's very interesting how the first prophet that I chose to read is prophet Isaiah. And the first chapter, chapter 1, is a chapter that slices to pieces religion. And you can read it when you get back home. You understand that God said in his own word, your Sabbaths, your new moons, your festivals, all of your things I hate. That's what he said. Not that he hate his word or his commandment. He hate what people turn them into. 
He hates the man-made system of do's and don'ts. And, and from the very beginning, you could see that that is the one biggest allegation of the establishment against Jesus was the fact that he, he was basically exposing religiosity. And I believe that our, one of our biggest problems nowadays even is religion. And we have to be very, very, very careful to always stick to the Word of God and not to fall into man-made um, laws and rules that are, that's exactly what keeps away or turn off the younger generation. And I think that's why the biggest sin, one of the biggest sins of the church in teaching the Bible is that they have ignored 30% of the Bible for the longest time. And these are the, the pro Bible prophecies. And why? Because people had a hard time with them. They don't understand them. They don't understand what he talks about. Therefore, let's not talk about it. Whereas when Jesus walked on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples, and he saw how much they completely did not understand who he is and what his, what his coming was all about, he told them, Oh, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe that which the prophets were writing. In other words, we can even go to church. We can even call ourselves followers of Christ and miss the whole point. If we don't understand what his role and what, his, what, what, what he came for. And so this is why, for me, as a Jewish person born to a Jewish family, attending synagogue on, on the holidays only, because I, I always thought I want to you know, get to know God, but once I got there, I was so turned off by religion. You know, people would take the book and read, and, and they would pray while looking all around and seeing who is here, who is not, and why is not here, and why. And then I was so turned off by all the religious practices and I was so drawn to God but I couldn't find him there and of course the long story is that in the very lowest point of my life when I wanted to take my life when I wanted to not stay here anymore this is when he reached out to me with his hand and then I, I'll never forget it I pray that night to, and I ask God I didn't even know how to pray you understand, a Jewish person, I have no clue how to pray because everybody's praying with prayer books, which I understood then already, that are written by someone else. <laughs> That's his prayer, not mine. So how do I pray? Well, I decided to sit and write a prayer and I put it on the wall, I knelt down and I read and I literally said, if you exist, show me who Jesus is. Everybody around me is now praying in the name of Jesus. What's going on here? And the next day I went to work before school and I opened the newspaper and I see a big page advertisement with big bold capital Hebrew letters, Yeshua. That's the Hebrew name for Jesus. And apparently the Campus Crusade Jesus film was showing in Jerusalem for two nights only before the authorities realized what it's all about and took it off. <laughs> so look at me. I'm a mega celebrity. <laughs> a whole movie production was done for me. <laughs> they made sure the movie will be on, you know, on the, in movie theaters in Jerusalem just for me. I saw the Hebrew version of it. And just for your information, most of the cast of that movie were Israeli actors. So I'm looking at Israeli actors, I look at the scenery, it's all Israel, I see the language is Hebrew, and all I see is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, one after the other. I was speechless. I had to say, okay, at the very end, I had to say yes or no, but I can't just say I don't know anymore. So I prayed and I accepted Jesus into my, my, my life that night, and that's where everything changed. Everything changed. First of all, I got kicked out of the house, which is <laughs> a good change, I guess. And then, um, and then from now on, I, I could feel the hand of God upon me every step of the way. Um, and, and I could 
also understand how much it's not because of anything I ever did, but it's all because of who he is. All it takes, God is not interested in perfect people. By the way, he gave up on it. <laughs> if you're perfect, I guess he's not interested in you. And it's because he or none of us is perfect. And he's not looking for perfect people. He's looking to save those in order through his son's blood to perfect us. And, and that brings me to what's going on nowadays around the world. When you read the word of God, you understand that the wisdom not, is not coming from universities or colleges or even not from seminaries. The wisdom comes from reading the word, from immersing yourself with the word of God. And when you read and you find yourself in the word, then you basically take those spiritual glasses, you put them on, and everything becomes pretty much clear. You understand what's going on in this world right now. You understand that the mystery of lawlessness is indeed already at work. You understand that there is something in this world that yet is still restraining and you understand that the time is coming and that restrainer is going to be taken out of the way and then all hell will break loose. And probably six, seven months ago, America had a, an accident. The root for self-destruction that lasted eight years somehow came to a, a standstill because an accident took place. <laughs> Let me tell you something, guys. I held in my hands a copy of Newsweek with an interview of Hillary Clinton as president. Did you know that it existed? Yes. yes. The, the copy is there. On the cover, it's Madam President. And she described how she broke the glass ceiling. I think she broke something that night, but I'm not sure if the glass ceiling. I think it was the big screen over there. Guys, everything was well prepared and something went wrong. And I was not surprised, by the way. I, I must say, again, I'm not a prophet, remember? I come from a non-profit organization. <laughs> but I can tell you that I was not surprised. Not at all. In fact, I went to bed before I knew the results of the elections, knowing the results of the elections already. And I think the reason is very simple. What we see today, and you have to look very carefully. Now, let's forget politics. I'm not, I'm not a politician. In fact, I don't like politi politics and politicians that much. I had a very good friend, very, very good friend. Um, he's a boxer named Manny Pacquiao. Some of you know him. And um, the minute he turned, became senator, I'm no longer in touch with him. I mean, I, am, I don't want to be involved in politics in that country, and, and so I'm, I'm staying away. But the point is uh, that you need to remember always to put on you the spiritual biblical glasses, goggles, whatever you call it, and look at things with that perspective. You have to, first of all, you have to take a deep breath because what's going on here, you know, I can understand why you can break some screens, but you have to take two steps backwards and look at the whole picture. And, 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 and let's start, if you, if, you, if you don't mind, let's start with how the situation in the world right now Post Trump's election fits Bible prophecy better than any other election results that could have happened or could have been achieved uh, in November of 2016. We'll start with the fact that um, we have a coalition of countries built up right now in the Middle East on one side 
And we have a tremendous, I would call it, um, process that Europe is going, th going through right now, which throws away all the old politics to the garbage and brings about stuff that Europe had never seen before. And these two things, two, those two things that I was just mentioning right now, I could see them already in the Bible in prophecies written 2,800 years ago. For example, we're looking nowadays at several events that are happening simultaneously in the Middle East. Everybody knows that uh, there's a city called Damascus. Up until seven years ago, 95% of the population of the world never heard that name before. Just so you know, they never heard what, they don't even know what it is. Now about probably 80% of the population of the world knows exactly what Damascus is. And even they know where it is, surprisingly. And um, what happened is that about eight years ago, something very interesting happened. The elite of this world, about something like 12 very wealthy families, most of them live in Europe, some of them live in America, they decided it's time to push one strong effort for the one world government movement. Now it's funny because I've been watching that process for the last, I don't know, 20 years, because I'm not that old. <laughs> but I can tell you that um, when I researched and I did a lot of, I mean, I, I started for many messages on that issue, it goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 3. The effort of mankind to somehow replace God because someone in Genesis 3 told them that they can be like gods. That's, that's how it starts. And then, of course, the first time ever mankind pulled together to do something, it's to replace God. And so we, we, and we see that process. And it's very interesting because the elite met and they decided to give the newly appointed president of the United States of that time, who was groomed by them to that office, um, a task. You go and somehow create a chaotic um, situation in the Middle East that will bring down all of those tyrants because they are those that are standing on our way for a one world government. They won't let go of their seat. They won't collaborate with, with the effort to bring the world together. So you need to fly. You don't have to stop in Israel. They're not that important. Fly right above it and land in Egypt and start there. So he goes and lands in, in Cairo and goes to the Islamic University and tells the whole world that Islam is the best thing that ever happened to humanity. They invented every good thing that ever was invented. Um, I, I wouldn't expect him to say something else when you visit the Islamic University in Cairo, obviously. But then came something interesting. And then he said to the people, it's time to fight for freedom and it's time to have democracy in your countries. The New York Times, by the way, admitted that Barack Obama jump-started the Arab Spring. Just so you know. It, it's not the official stand of the White House, it was actually the media that is controlled by the same elite that is proudly saying, we started it. And it's very interesting because look what he did. He started with just throwing, now he was held as the Messiah by so many people at that time. He threw the idea of it is possible, yes you can, go ahead and, and, and fight for freedom. And people took him seriously. And violence started erupting in, in Tunisia, and Algeria, and in Egypt, and then in, in all the other countries. And then the 
Syrian president said, it's not going to happen here. I'm not going to let that happen. You see, when you are ruling on behalf of the minority, and you're not the majority, then you have all the reasons in the world to be afraid that they're going to throw you out. So what Assad decided is, I'm going to kill it when it's young. And there was a little demonstration in southern Syria, in the city of Dara. He basically killed everyone there. And the civil war in Syria started almost seven years ago because of a massacre done throughout one funeral in a smaller city in southern Syria. And when we talk about civil war, it, it started with the civilians. ISIS did not even exist at that time. None of the uh, terrorist organizations uh, were, were there. It was the civilians, the people that were you know, saying enough is enough. And some of the officers in the Syrian army defected and started the free Syrian army. And now you have a situation where Iraq is going through chaos because the Shiites are taking over. E uh, Syria is taking, uh, getting into chaotic area because of the Ar Arab Spring. And when there is chaos and there is no adult who is responsible around, that's where all the mice come out of their holes. And guess what happened? A leader called Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Abu Bakr is the name of the first caliph in the Islam after Muhammad. Al-Baghdadi, he's originally from Baghdad. And th the guy decided this is the right time to take advantage of all the chaos in Iraq and in Syria and start something new, something that is against the philosophy of most of jihadi movements in, around the world. The jihadi movements like Al-Qaeda always believed that you need to take one country at a time and at the very end when you control all of them you create Islamic State and thus the caliphate is being reestablished. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi said, nope, we're going to reverse it. We're going to create the Islamic State first and that's how we are going to expand. We're going to give the Arabs the hope that finally we have a state and that's when they will join us. That's exactly what happened, by the way. They joined them by the tens of thousands because they saw something that never existed before. And of course, he took advantage of the 21st century media and made sure that he is documenting every horrific practice so the world will see and give the psychos you know, the drive to come and join. And, um, and then, of course, ISIS was born as a result of the Arab Spring. Once ISIS was born, Russia says, wait a minute. We cannot afford Syria to fall in the hands of ISIS because we have interest in Syria. We have a, a seaport there. Russia invades. Iran says, wait a minute. ISIS is Sunni, we cannot afford that. We have a, a, an agenda to spread Shia from Iran, through Iraq, through Syria, to the Mediterranean. Turkey says, wait a minute. With all the little uh, thugs around that are now seeking independence, the Kurds might, God forbid, seek for independence as well, and we will be out. So we better go in and roll our tanks also and do something about that. And what happened is, just according to the script, chaos began in Syria, from once a sovereign state, is the playground of everybody who has interest in the region. Different interests, by the way. Iranians wants to spread the Shia. The Turks wants to stop the Kurds. The Russians wants the gas and oil. Everyone has his own, but they all are right now in Syria. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because the last time I checked, my Bible, the prophet Ezekiel, 2,800 years ago, said that once Israel is safe and secure and prosperous back in its land, there will be a war. 
and he's using the biblical names of the region of Russia, Turkey, and Iran as those that will come against Israel. Very interesting. He could have used any other region. He could have used any other country. He could have used any other scenario of, of no. And the funny thing, and I, I was thinking to myself, okay, so the Bible is clearly indicating those countries, but how come they are going to attack us when they are so far away? And then the prophet Isaiah made sure that we understand that the city of Damascus, chapter 17, verse 1, will cease from being a city. It will become a heap of ruins. That city existed for the last 3,500 years, just so you know. Damascus has never been utterly destroyed. Never. And so prophet Isaiah is basically talking about a future event. Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10 says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times, 2800 years ago, things that are not yet done, Damascus is for. And if you ask all the experts in the Middle East, it's only a matter of time until Damascus is going to fall because it cannot hold itself together. We're talking about too many factions, too many groups, too many uh, different uh, streams and currents and too many uh, uh, um, ideologies and interests. It's amazing. Now, who is going to destroy Damascus? I learned one thing in my life. Where the Bible is silent, you better be silent. And I also learned that in the military. <laughs> Even if you know something, you better be silent. But I can tell you one thing. It doesn't really matter who is going to destroy Damascus. Israel will be blamed for it. 1990-1991, George Bush the father. Iraq invaded into Kuwait. America goes to help. A coalition is being established. They roll the tanks into Baghdad. And guess who is being attacked? America and the coalition is over there in Iraq. And guess who is being attacked by Iraq? Israel. 39 Scud missiles were flying towards Israel. We didn't even do anything. We weren't even there. Blame the Jew. Now you have to understand something. That's how it works in the Middle East. All of their internal problems will always find a solution when they unite over one thing, and that's of course against Israel. And for years, they were united against Israel. And for years, I've been teaching that they're not going to stay united. And people were laughing at me. Because, of, of course, they hate us. That's the religion, and that's this and that. And I said, guys, you don't understand something. The Bible says clearly, in the same prophecy of the attack on Israel, that there will be at least one major big Arab country that will criticize this attack. And the last time I read, it is called Sheba and Didan. And the last time I checked, Sheba and Didan is Saudi Arabia of today. So Saudi Arabia is making a U-turn and from sponsoring terrorism heavily, is actually moving to the side of criticizing the sponsors, Qatar, hello, and moving to the side of those who benefit from financial relationship with Israel. And for, for, for the longest time I used to say that, and then came the accident. <laughs> Your accident. 
and your accident shows up, and I'm sorry, I don't want to disrespect, I really like him a lot, just so you know. I like him a lot because he's so not a politician. <laughs> and I like him a lot because he knows the system so good, and that's what drives him crazy. <laughs> it is the same people that came to his parties three years ago and admired him, it is the same people who love the way he made money. It is the same people who didn't care about his womanizing. And it's the same people who, who only said great things about him, who waited for him to always say good word, who actually loved every tweet. <laughs> it's the same people who didn't care to get money for him as long as it's to their party. And suddenly, this is the devil. And the funny thing is, he's still the same. <laughs> and it's interesting because he shows up, his first ever foreign tour, the first country he landed in is what? Israel. Nope. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. <laughs> now, a lot of uh, Christians, you know Christians, tell you something. They vote for someone because they think he's going to be the next pastor. They don't understand, the guy is a politician, and, or whatever, he's in a public position, and he's not your pastor, he's not an evangelist, he's the United States president. And how come he didn't land in Israel first? Oh, we didn't care that he go to Saudi first. In fact, let me give you a secret. We ask him to go there first. Did you know that? No, well, let me tell you, when Netanyahu was in Washington, they met behind closed doors, and Netanyahu said to Donald Trump the following thing. For the last 20 years, we've been trying to have peace with the Palestinians, and their, big, their, their weapon was, you never have peace with the Arab world unless you give us whatever we want. Well, it didn't work for 20 years. How about changing it? Having peace with the Arab world, and that will cause them to finally sit and talk and maybe reach a deal. Why don't we work, and, and Netanyahu is a genius, just so you know. I want you to know that. He came to Donald Trump and said to him, Donald, you're a businessman. You don't really need the small, tiny deal between Israel and Palestinians when you can get the ultimate deal. Have you heard that name, that word before? Ultimate deal. Have you noticed that ever since Netanyahu's visit to Washington, D.C., they're talking about the ultimate deal all the time? And what is the ultimate deal? Peace with Israelis and Palestinians won't really play any role in trying to neutralize Iran or the dominance of Russia. But if we start with the big picture and start somehow pushing the Arab world to understand the Sunni Arab world, to understand that as long as they stand against Israel, Iran is celebrating, that may change their mind. So Trump took notes, called his advisors, and said, let's plan a tour, Saudi first, because I need to deliver a message to the king. And I need then to go to Jerusalem to bring the message to the prime minister. Now you understand why he flew all the way there. And then he told his advisors, the speech writers, I need First, to tell the Saudis that I want a big conference of all the moderate Sunni leaders and I want to tackle the whole support of terrorism right there and right there and I want to make them understand that there's a new guy in the White House and if they want to be on my side and fight with me and if they want to somehow stop the I would say wild expansion of Iran, they have to be on the right side. 
He goes to the Arab world, to their face, saying to the whole leadership of the Arab Sunni world, you call your land holy? Then kick them out of your holy land. If, these are, if, if they represent Islam, then I'm sure you're not in agreement with it. And if they do not represent Islam, why do you tolerate it? You have to do something about it. Then he left. By the way, he started a fire, and he left. <laughs> then he landed in Israel. Pay attention. The Saudis received him like a king, unlike Obama, knowing that his best friend is Netanyahu, knowing that he brought a message from Netanyahu, knowing that he believes of the Jewish rights over Jerusalem, and knowing that he's about to go as first president in the history of the United States to visit the Western Wall while being president of the United States. First ever. Knowing all of that, they liked him. Why? Because at least we know what we're dealing with. For the last eight years, somebody was telling us he likes us, and he was stabbing us every time we turn around. And we found him in bed with Iran. And not just in bed with Iran. There's one thing that a lot of you may not know. But when the Iranians had a deal with the Americans, I don't know if you know the Middle East, but we don't cut a deal just like that. You put your price, we put our price. You put your price, we put our price. Boom, 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 boom. And somewhere, we're going to meet in the middle. Well, the Americans, thought that the deal was over when they shook hands. Well, no, and not in Farsi. <laughs> they have a different understanding of things. They came to the table and they told him, if you want the deal to be approved, then we want millions of dollars cash. The State Department, the White House, they're all looking at each other. What, what do you mean cash? Cash. C-A-S-H. <laughs> the last time I checked, cash is essential only for one thing. To not being traced. And the last time I checked, it is either terrorist or criminal activity. That's it. The Iranians told the Americans, find a reason in your books to justify that, and we want the cash. So the Americans went back, looked at the books, and they found that there are some assets that were frozen 30, 40 years ago, and probably it's worth that much money, so 20 million is now 200 million because of all the interest. So now we can at least tell the American public that uh, that's the money. Yeah, but how do you justify the cash? Well, we will tell the American people that the system to wire money doesn't work. <laughs> Iran was out of that SWIFT system, so we have to get them cash. So the Americans brought the cash, and what did the Iranians do? They told them, take it back. We want cash, but not US dollars. We don't like your money, and we sure don't like the serial numbers on your money. <laughs> Humiliated, you had corporate jets, actually they're Lear jets that belongs to the American government, flying from one central bank to another to pick up foreign currency, to put it in huge bags and deliver it to the Iranians. And by doing that, America has officially become the largest sponsor of terrorism in the world. And the American public had no clue. Much of it is directly related to the Benghazi affair. I don't have time to start going into that, and I, I will need 50 gallons of coffee right now to withstand the 
boiled blood that I will have when I talk about those things. But I just need you to understand, guys. Everyone in the system knew what's going on. Nobody talked because they were all part of the system. And someone who used to host all the parties and all the events, who used to donate money to those, that party, he used to be the ear into which they whispered all the little things. Suddenly he runs for president. He knows all the ins and outs. He knows the system. He knows who they are, what they did. He knows what the motives be behind it. And now he is elected. Do you understand? It's like, it's like somebody with whom you confided for that many years and suddenly he's summoned to court. He's going to spill the beans. You have to do something to kill that witness. And for the past seven months, what you're watching every single day is the attempt to kill the witness because he knows too much. Remember, I'm not into politics. <laughs> What I want you to understand is, why did I start talking about all of this? Because look what happened in the Gulf area since he left. Qatar is being singled out as the, sp the largest sponsor of terrorism. Did you know that Qatar probably paid, uh, you probably heard that, but Qatar owns the Democratic Party, literally. It all started with Bill Clinton already, but Al Gore, you've heard of him, <laughs> when he left uh, the White House, um, he bought a small TV station, something that I don't think he paid more than a million dollars. Qatar paid him $500 million for that TV station. Now, if that's not bribery, I don't know what it is. And they took that and made it Al Jazeera in America. And Al Jazeera in America is to be the trumpet, not Trump, the trumpet, <laughs> for the Arab Spring. If I can tell you up front, we know that if Al Jazeera did not exist, 600,000 people would be still alive. I, I can tell you up front. They were those who ignited, poured some oil in the fire, and made sure that all the countries will start their uprising and uproar, and they will be killed by the you know, thousands every month. So Donald Trump left that area, and now the Saudis are saying, it's time for us to deal with Qatar. For the longest time, the Qataris were playing a double game. They, they, they were the Sunnis with us, but they sponsored, guess who? The Houthis rebels in Yemen. Houthis rebels in Yemen are attacking Saudi Arabia every day. Rockets were flying to Mecca and Medina, just so you know, <laughs> by the Houthi rebels that are getting all of their stuff from Iran. So the Saudis suffer from Iran indirectly from Yemen, and Qatar funded the Muslim Brotherhood that caused so much damage to the Egyptians. So the Egyptians and the Saudis, the two largest countries in the region, suffer greatly from that tiny little dot on the map called Qatar because of their hundreds of billions of dollars that are poured into the system. Now they're not only doing that, they bought banks, they bought department stores, they bought football teams, they bought rights to broadcast sport events, they even bribed FIFA, the Football Association, so they can have the World Cup in 2022 in Doha, Qatar, because that's how you get into the mainstream, that's how you get to the public, not only and right now, your internet and your Facebook is flooded with little short clips of how come Qatar is the good guys here and Saudi Arabia are the bad guys in this whole area. 
rigged system for sure. So now Donald Trump lands in Jerusalem, comes to the prime minister's office and says to him, I've got a yes from the king. Ladies and gentlemen, the mother of Sunni Islam, the mother of 85% of the Muslims worldwide, the mother of the holiest sites in the world for Islam, is actually switching sides before our very eyes. And the world is not even aware of that. You know who is aware of that? The Iranians. And you know who is the proxy of Iran in Lebanon? Hezbollah. And you know what the leader of the Hezbollah yesterday said? Muslims, be careful. Look what happened. We are becoming friends with Israel without Israel giving the Palestinians anything in return. He's watching the process happening. And he's calling the kid or his name. Ladies and gentlemen, at the same time that the Middle East is shaping itself for those that will attack Israel and those that will stand on the other side and criticize, Europe is going through a major change as well. Now you have to understand something. The, the, the French just elected a president who has no clue that he's the president. <laughs> and for the most part, the French has no clue who that their president is. All they know is that 20 years ago, he was only 19 years old, dating his teacher, who later on divorced her husband to marry her student. They showed pictures of 30 years ago, and they show her walking with a little toddler on the beach. Never mind. But <laughs> that's them 30 years ago. But um, my point is the chaos in the Middle East. Now, look what happened. The elite sent someone to start the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring worked in two ways chaos. <coughs> in the Middle East, and the chaos brought massive wave of immigration into Europe. The Europeans are panicking, what's going on here? The very extreme right wing is rising in Europe, and the French are so afraid. You see, Europe has a problem. It remembers its past of 1930s and 40s, and Europe is afraid to go back there. So in the effort to fight ex extremism, look what happened. They were so panicky that Marie Le Pen is going to win and become president of France that they, ra they ran and voted for someone. They have no clue who it is. And the French did not even pay attention that even in the very day that he became president, it's not the French Marseillaise uh, national anthem that was played. It was the European one. And I know French. They're very proud people. They will not, they will not talk English to you. You go to France, you better know to speak French. If not, they will hit you with their baguette. <laughs> No, no, no. And I'll tell you something. <laughs> the guy become president, two days later, shows up on TV. And guess what language he's talking? English. First time ever in the history of French presidents in modern days, although I believe Napoleon did not speak uh, to his people in English also, standing before the cameras, speaking fluent English, and not talking just to the French people, talking to the whole world. Telling the world that President Trump just pulled out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, and therefore, he opened the gate of France to 
all the American scientists and researchers to come and work in France to make our planet great again. <laughs> These are the words he, he used. Five days ago, The Economist on their front page shows Macron walking on water. And they say, the savior of Europe. Now, people are asking me, do you think he is the Antichrist? <laughs> What am I, a prophet? <laughs> I told you I'm not. But my job is not to point at who is the Antichrist, because if I do, that means I'm left behind. <laughs> my job is to point at a process. Europe is ready to choose a leader that will assume upon himself leadership, not just of that country, but of the whole continent, of the whole world. You see, the elite has been trying for years to find a way to convince the world that one, gov one world government works and is the best for them. And for years they failed. Whenever they introduced war, war only made countries more nationalistic. Hunger didn't work. Diseases didn't work. So what are we going to do? Oh. Climate change. You know that every summer, temperatures goes up. Did you know that? Every summer, shark bites cases goes up. Did you know that? Yes. Every summer, people buy more ice cream. Did you know that? So scientists looked at that and they said, hmm, shark bites? Ice cream? There has to be a connection. I mean, at the same time people eat more ice cream, there are more shark bites. Maybe we need to reduce the consumption of ice cream. <laughs> This is the logic of the climate change people. You understand? They tell you the temperatures goes up Because at the same time, we're in modern world, the emission of, of, of what? Carbon dioxide went up. Really? It's just like ice cream, by the way. Well, let me tell you something. Up until the mid-1700s, or maybe towards the end, the Thames in London used to freeze every winter. Did you know that? Freeze. Starting from the mid 1700s, it's not freezing anymore. Now, remind me how many factories with carbon, with what? Carbon what he said? <laughs> carbon dioxide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> remind me how many factories existed then that caused the Thames to stop freezing? And remind me, how come the world is alarmed when it's getting warmer, when we all know from creation that warmer is better? No, if you had a choice between Antarctica and Florida, <laughs> forget about Florida, Texas. <laughs> I don't even know why you're not yet your own country. <laughs> I will be the first one to vote for this country of Texas. You, I mean, one of my most favorite states in America is Texas. You can still find the good old America in many places, because America is changing. I, I mean, I've been coming to America for the last probably 18 years. And I, who comes from outside, I can detect huge change 
all across the United States, even here in DFW. I don't want to depress you, but I want you to understand that Europe is ready, the Middle East is ready, and the only question that I can ask you this evening is, are you ready? You see, God works in two tracks. There's the track of world events, and there's a track of your life. Parallel tracks. World events, you will not be able to change. Yeah, but I voted for Donald Trump. Exactly. And if anything happened, is that more things took place that fits the Bible. Oh, I thought I voted for a change. You sure did. It may change your life. But world events have been determined, not orchestrated, it's two different things. But God knows already what the leaders of the world are going to say before they even thought about it. When he sent Moses, he said to Moses, Moses, listen, you're going to talk to Pharaoh. And Moses is like, what? So yes. And who else? Oh, you're going to come to your people and tell them that God sent you. Really? And, and excuse me, what's your name? <laughs> who am I going to tell them that sent me? Tell them I am sent you. Moses is about to go to Pharaoh, and God tells Moses, by the way, Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh, you're going to talk to him, and he is not going to allow you to do that. God knows what Pharaoh is going to do and say before Pharaoh ever saw Moses. Because we have a God that knows all things. And it's hard for us as human beings to grasp the the, the realm of omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, we don't understand that. Now he is not surprised when Russia pulls into Syria. He is not surprised when Iran is pulling into Syria. He's not even surprised that an organization called ISIS existed. ISIS was just a hanger that they put all of their excuses on. ISIS is going to disappear. I mean, jihadists will remain. They want to kill you. They want to murder. But just under a different organization, they're, they're almost done. But the idea is not done. But I want you to understand that ISIS is not a surprise. And Russia's invasion is not a surprise. And the Iranian invasion is not a surprise. And the Turkish invasion is not a surprise. And let me tell you what. The Prime Minister of Israel thought this is the best chance in the world right now to go to Africa and to get the support of the African world in the state of Israel. We need some support in the UN, which I call United Nothing or Unnecessary. <laughs> so he goes to Africa, starts talking to the, world, the leaders of Africa, and guess what? Last month, he was the first ever non-African leader that was invited to the Western African Economic Forum. Ever in the history of Africa, a non-African is the keynote speaker. All the African countries are now running after Israel for business and collaboration, except of two. Who are those countries? Two countries, by the way, that vowed to destroy Israel up until today. Libya and Sudan. Why am I telling you that over dinner and holding you from eating cake and coffee? <laughs> because the same prophet, Ezekiel, that described how Russia, Rosh, and Meshach, and Tuval, and Iran, Persia, and Turkey, Gomer, and Togarma, he said, that the same attack will be also with Put and Kush, which is Sudan and Libya. And here we are. 
A year ago, I could tell you that half of Africa is against us. Now I can tell you that we narrow it down to the exact five countries that are going to come against us. The, set, the stage is set. And you tell me that the Bible is not accurate. God told Daniel, Daniel the prophet, the exact month of the exact year that Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem and be crucified. Tomorrow, if you come to church, you'll, you'll hear about it. You better be there. <laughs> but my point is this. Our God is not a religious God. Our God is not into the big picture. You do whatever you want to do in the smaller details. He is the God of our lives in the tiny little smallest detail of everything that happens to us. And he wants you to know that he's in full control and that 2,800 years ago, he could tell you what 2017 is going to look like. And the only thing that he ever left for you, the only thing, is to choose. I told you, you cannot change world events. You'll try. You can stand outside of the European Parliament and say, I will not allow the Antichrist to rise. It's not going to help you. <laughs> you can stand in front of the Kremlin and say, I'm not going to allow the Russians to invade into it. It's not going to help you. But there is one thing you can do, and you should do, and you better do, especially in light of what is going on. Remember, the track of world events is set. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, the Lord says the following thing. In verse 19, he says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. The choice of choosing life is in our very hands. Everything is set. He knows what's going to happen. But as an individual, you and you alone can choose. And there's only one source of life. There's only one way, one truth, one life. The only one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. The only one who ever, in the history of mankind, died, resurrected, and never died again. That's why he's called the first fruits from among those who fell asleep. He is the first fruit. Wait a minute, I thought Lazarus uh, was resurrected too. Yeah, but he died again. Where is he? Dead. Yeah, but I thought Elijah went up without dying. Exactly, he never died. The only one who died to pay the price for all of our sins. Yet death could not hold him and he resurrected and he's still alive. Is Jesus. He is the resurrection and the life. And if some of you here this evening, you never chose him, I want to tell you something. The clock is ticking. God is trying to tell you, can't you see? You're in trouble. You cannot anymore say, I didn't know. I dragged all the way from Mexico City somewhere to just tell you to your face that it is waiting for you to choose and to choose life. 
I came to give you life, Jesus said, and life in abundance. My life changed completely. From wanting to die, I want to live. From having zero confidence to speak to tens of thousands of people. From having no parents in my life. I have thousands of women that call me their mother, my, uh, my mother. <laughs> you can laugh. And a lot of fathers. And I have the best father in the world. Our Heavenly Father, who takes good care of me every single day. You know what? I'm not afraid. People ask me if I'm afraid to live in Israel. I'm afraid when I travel, <laughs> especially in America. I was in New York City the night before 9-11. On these towers, I saw what happened the next day. And I can tell you something, guys. Evil can reach everywhere. It can be in Afghanistan. It can be in India, in the Philippines. It can be in Israel. It can be in Syria. It can be in America. And it's definitely in Europe. The question is not whether the world is perfect or not. We know that the world... <laughs> Creation is yearning for the return of its creator. Time is running out. Tomorrow, I want to urge you to come. We're going to do two services tomorrow, as you know. The first one, we will talk about the 70 weeks of Daniel, which is fascinating to see how accurate God is to the month of the year, and that of course was hundreds of years prior to the, to the coming of Jesus that Daniel could see exactly the month of his coming, exactly the time of, of the exact year. But we will also, during the second service, talk about the term Gog and Magog. And you're going to learn tomorrow that there are actually two Gog and Magogs in the scriptures. And for the most part, it is the second one that should interest you more than the first. So I want to encourage you to come tomorrow to hear the rest of the story. But tonight, I want to encourage you to take heed of the things that you heard. This was a little sample. I could stand here and talk forever on world events because we didn't even talk about, really, the actual events. We talked about the big picture. And in reality, Christians should not deal with every single dot that happened in the Middle East. You need to see the full picture. Take two steps backwards, take a deep breath, and look at the picture, read your Bible, and let the news confirm what you already know from the Bible let your knowledge be Bible-based and not news-based. I call the media the Medianites. <laughs> and I want you to know that one of the reasons I felt so compelled to start doing the weekly updates is because watching your media, and I'm telling you, even Fox News is no longer what it used to be, um, you are in big trouble. Very big trouble. And so as, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care about the inner politics in America and the, the, the health care bill and all that. I don't know what's going on there. I only know that, you know, people like attention. So they will always oppose and oppose and oppose until they get the full ex, you know, exposure. And, but I do know that um, as far as what's going on in the Middle East, I think Locals there can see better than your news networks. The Clinton News Network and all the rest of them. <laughs> so I, I want to encourage you to do your own homework. But more so I want to encourage you to trust this book. This book not only has life in it, 
but it has the past, the present, and the future. It's his story. And I want you to know that once you accept Christ and you do that right choice, you know exactly the end of the story. And you're no longer panicking about it. You know who the winning part is. You know what you're going to go through. It's so one thing I appreciate about Jesus. He never lied. He's the truth. He told the disciples, in this world, you're going to have tribulations. But be a good cheer. I have overcome this world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you know the end from the beginning. That you, through your prophets, that were moved by the Holy Spirit, gave us your plan because it wasn't any private interpretation of anyone. I thank you, Father, that this evening you brought people from different parts of the state and ways of life, maybe even religious affiliation. But tonight, we put aside religion and we want to talk about relationship. So, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will stir up the hearts of your people to respond to your call to choose life. And as time goes by and running out, the urgency of the times and the seasons even more so, that we need to make up our mind very quickly. So we thank you this evening and we praise you and we admire how you are a God of the big picture as much as the little tiny small details in our lives. So Father, I thank you for everyone that is here. And I, I want to commit them into your beautiful hands. Salvation is not about what we do, it's about what you already did. Salvation is not through works, but it's by grace, lest anyone boast. So we thank you, Father, that in us and through us and by us, we couldn't really save ourselves. But 2,000 years ago, the Lamb of God came and offered himself. And he's the high priest seated right now by you. And he will come back as the Lion of Judah to establish his throne for him and for us. So we thank you and we bless you. And I would like to conclude with proclaiming over you the Aaronic blessing in Hebrew from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'yichuneka. Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom. Shalom is peace. And that's the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. It's the peace that the world cannot give nor can even understand. But it's the peace that God wants to give all of you in the troubling reality of this crazy world. In this world, you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, Jesus said, for I have overcome this world. We thank you and we bless you, Father, for these words. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.